Greetings and welcome to uh, video number two of the series in which we build a Fender Champ amp from the wreckage of an old precision uh, signal generator and other articles found in the bottom of our junk bin. The prevailing wisdom may be that the nightmare is on Elm Street, but I would contend that it's right here in this workshop. Look at the mess that I created while trying to make this little 6 inch by 9 inch amp. Look over here. Here's the table where all the videos are made. Doesn't look like there's much room for that now. I just came in this morning. I couldn't believe. What a mess. Here's the shipping papers for the uh, transformers. There it is. I'll show you more of that in a little while. But I think I'm going to stop now. I'm going to have to clean all this up uh, so that we can even continue. Rusty, what are you doing? What are you doing, Rusty? Rusty, you ready to clean up this workshop? I guess not. Well, Rusty and I finally got that hideous mess cleaned up, and now it's time to take a look at what caused it all. Um, here's the little uh, Fender Champ chassis that was scratch built from the a lot of the pieces from that old um, signal generator. Let's take a look at the front control panel first. Uh, here we have the on and not on switch. Off has gotten to be so trite. Uh, got our indicator light and a chicken head from the old uh, signal generator. Volume control and then the instrument input. Now with the input jack from that old military radio. Sans toilet seat cover. Now let's take a look at the top. I know that Fender Champ chassis are a little tried also, but I tried to make this one different. Uh, there's probably four features in this that are rather special and we'll take a little time to look at them. But first let's take a look at the top. I uh, got our tubes, uh, 5Y3, 6V6, and 12AX7 with a new um, shield. And then back here we have the speaker output, and instead of putting two output jacks, one 4 and one 8 ohm, I made it switchable. So you just plug the speaker in here and then switch to either 4 ohm or 8 ohm. I'll show you how I did that and why I did that in just a minute. And then this mysterious knob here. This is a adjustable negative feedback loop. Now this is something I'd heard about and I never tried and it makes a huge difference on the sound of the amp. Okay, I'll show you underneath how I did it and then we'll listen and see if it was worth the trouble. And here's the output transformer that I waited for. Nothing really remarkable on the back. Uh, I just labeled the fuse so that nobody would put in the 20 amp automotive fuse like uh, some people are tempted to do. Okay, let's flip it over and take a look inside. Okay, here's the underside of the chassis, and like I said, this amp has four what I consider special features, which I will uh, show you very closely in just a minute. But first, let's take a look at the overall uh, wiring scheme. Uh, with the power supply isolated down here on the lower left, with the filter capacitors uh, and power transformer, and then the input jack and 12AX7 up here as far away as it can be and still be within the chassis. All of the alternating current uh, filament wires are tightly twisted to cut down on hum. And I found that running them up high and then coming down to the tube is better than running them along the chassis surface and surrounding the tube. Uh, it tends to hum a little less when they just drop down. I think when they wrap around the tube, they actually create a field between the two wires and uh, cause uh, a little bit of hum. Okay, now let's focus on some of the features that make this an unusual little amp. Number one will be the switchable output jack for the speaker. Here's the output jack and here's the double pole, double throw switch that controls it. First let's take a look at the schematic of the output transformer so that we can see how it's wired. First off, this uh, particular output transformer came with two different input impedances, 5K and 8K. And I feel the 5K suits a single 6V6 better. So I connected the red wire over here to the B+, and the brown wire comes up here to the plate 
of the 6V6. The blue wire, which was the 8K input, is connected over here to a dummy terminal strip to keep it out of trouble. That takes care of the primary wiring. Now let's look over here at the secondary wiring. This one uh, uh, output transformer has a black common lead and then it has a yellow 4 ohm output and a green 8 ohm output. Now uh, the black wire then, which was common, comes over here to the ground of the output jack. But the yellow, which is 4 ohm, and the green, which is 8 ohm, go to opposite ends of the double throw switch. Then from the center of the, of the double throw switch, we run a wire over here to the hot or uh, output uh, contact here on the jack. So that when you flip the switch one way, you're connecting the 4 ohm output to the output jack. When you flip the switch the other way, you're connecting the green 8 ohm output to the output jack. I hope that makes sense. Now you may ask, why not just have two output jacks, one for 8 ohms and one for 4 ohms? And the problem is that the CHAMP circuit uses a negative feedback loop. Okay, from the cathode of the 6V6 to the uh, output from the output transformer. Now, since this has two outputs, green and yellow, 4 ohm and 8 ohm, which one do you connect the a negative feedback loop to? Uh, if whichever one you connected it to, then you would have no feedback loop on the other. You can't connect it to both, or you would be shorting the uh, output windings. So the answer is to, to use the double pole, double throw switch, and connect your negative feedback loop to the single output that goes to the speaker jack. Here's the negative feedback circuit on the champ. Uh, as you can see, it originates right here from the output jack to the speaker, comes back here through a 22K ohm resistor, and then runs to the cathode of the 12AX7 preamp tube. And here's how it works. The stronger the signal is, the greater the volume coming through here and through the output transformer, the more negative feedback you get to the cathode, which in turn suppresses the volume. So it's sort of like you have a governor on the volume. The higher you turn it up, the more it is suppressed. Now it will go up in volume, but it will never reach the point where your headroom becomes absolute zero, okay? And then the speaker just sounds like trash. Okay, so the negative feedback loop then in smaller amps with smaller speakers helps keep uh, you from just over uh, driving the speaker and eliminating all of your headroom. Now I thought it might be interesting, instead of having a fixed 22K ohm resistor here, why not put in a variable resistor, a potentiometer that can range from 10K to 50K. Now, and it's right here. Now, you put a 10K ohm resistor in series with it because otherwise if you turn this down to zero, you would have 100% negative feedback to the cathode of your 12AX7, which would not be a good situation. So, no matter how low I turn the pot, I will have 10K ohms of resistance here, okay, to protect my 12AX7. But then I can turn up another 40K with this so that I end up with a total of 50K ohms of resistance in the negative feedback loop. And having a variable resistor in this position allows me to go from 10K to 50K, which, allow, which will bracket the 22K resistor that's normally found in this circuit. So I can go much lower and much higher, increasing and decreasing the negative feedback, and then uh, seeing how it affects the tone of the amp. And as you will see, it has a tremendous effect on the compression, uh, the tone, and the headroom of the output signal. I've never done this before, but I'm telling you, this is really a nice uh, little addition to an amp, and it gives you a lot of flexibility and tone control. Especially on an amp that's kind of famous for not having any tone control. For the next special feature of this amp, I'm going to direct your attention over here to the cathode bias resistor on the 6V6. Now, if you watched my biasing of single-ended amp video, you know that the way this tube is biased is to alter this resistor. If you increase the resistance, you lower the plate dissipation. 
If you reduce this resistance, you increase the plate dissipation. But finding the exact bias resistance value is sort of a trial and error uh, experience where you jump around different values of resistor until you get the right plate dissipation. So it occurred to me, why not make this resistor a variable resistor? And I did. Here it is right here. Uh, this is a very high precision variable resistor that can range from 0 to 1000 ohms as you turn this little screw head. Uh, it's wired between the cathode lug of the 6V6 and ground. After I installed it, I turned the little screw head until it was at exactly 470 ohms, which is what the uh, schematic called for. But then, once I got the amp running, I could test my plate dissipation and measure it and alter this resistor to get exactly the right plate dissipation. And I'm talking within like a uh, hundredth of a watt. When and if I ever change this 6V6 tube, all I have to do is flip over the chassis and repeat the procedure, which can be done in a matter of like a minute or two, adjusting that screw head and getting exactly the right cathode bias resistor value. Which leads us to the fourth and final modification to this chassis. Now, I grant you, uh, it's going to seem like it's the least impressive, but in the long run, it's one of the most effective. And it has to do with these two little 100 ohm resistors here. Now, these are the two wires that are carrying the 6 volts to the filament of the 6V6 and the 12AX7. Because it's December and the Christmas season, I thought I'd be festive and make them in, uh, put in Christmas colors. But we have a problem here with this transformer. It has no center tap for the 6 volt winding. Now, most uh, filament transformers will have a center tap on the 6 volt winding, and you ground it, which will suppress the hum a great deal in your tubes. If you don't have a center tap, as this transformer does not have, then you have to create what we call a virtual center tap. So to significantly reduce the hum in this uh, amp, I added a 100 ohm resistor from each of the 6 volt lugs to ground, which creates a virtual center tap. This is the same as if this right here were a center tap and it was grounded and the reduction of hum is significant. If you didn't know about that, now you do. On any of your amps that are humming, check the 6 volt uh, windings on the uh, filament transformer. See if you have a center tap. If it's grounded, well then your hum is coming from some other source. If it's not grounded, ground it. If you don't have a center tap, then create a virtual one with two 100 ohm resistors. Well, that about does it for the circuit features of this uh, little chassis. Let's flip it over, plug it in, and see how it sounds. And also, let's see how the adjustable negative feedback loop affects the tone of the amp. Okay, we're plugged in. The power switch is flipped from not on to on. And as you can see from the pilot light, everything's working. Uh, no smoke yet. Volume is at less than one half, and the negative feedback loop is at about 22K, which is the original setting. And I'm playing through the infamous Natco 12 inch workshop speaker. Well, it's got great volume and a good balanced tone. Uh, nice and clean, uh, pretty good headroom. Sounds good to me. Okay, now with the negative feedback resistor up to around 50K, which is pretty much like removing the negative feedback loop. Wow, a lot more gain, uh, much more dynamic sounding. Kind of loose and open, um, lower lows, higher highs. 
Now I'm going to try the negative feedback loop at its lowest resistance, which would be maximum negative feedback. flatter, uh, not as dynamic, uh, a little less frequency response, seems kind of compressed to me. Okay, now much higher volume and the negative feedback at 22K. Starting to break up a little bit, uh, really sounded pretty good, good tone, uh, good even response. I think we can see why Fender picked 22K for the negative feedback loop, it really does sound pretty good. Now 50K at fairly high volume. Quite a bit of a breakup in overdrive and a, a substantial increase in volume. Okay, the volume will stay in the same higher uh, position, but now we're at 10K on the negative feedback loop. Almost no breakup, despite the increase in volume, uh, a lot more headroom uh, with this low negative feedback resistor setting. Rusty, you want to hear me play Gloria a few more times? I don't blame you. Well, I've got the power switch flipped to the not on position, and I wanted to apologize for playing the same lousy passage over and over again. But if you want to make a direct comparison uh, between different settings, I think you really need to hear the same thing, just different ways. I'd like to think, though, that it gave us a, a really a good feeling for the effect of a negative feedback loop on the tone of an amplifier. I would also hope that uh, when I went through the details of the construction on the interior that it would help uh, people who are planning on making their own amps uh, to make some choices. And also for those uh, who are just interested in how amps work, it would give you some more insights. I feel like this turned out well enough that it deserves its own cabinet. So I'll probably make a video in the near future here showing you how to do a finger jointed uh, little cabinet uh, for a small amplifier chassis like this. And then there might be a fourth edition uh, showing how to upholster it uh, with either like Tolex or Naga Hide or Leatherette, something like that. I've been asked to make videos like this, so it looks like you're going to get your, your wish. And coincidentally, since it's the Christmas season, speaking of getting your wish, Rusty and I uh, want to wish you all the best and hope you'll stay tuned for future videos. We hope that you'll subscribe to our channel, but most of all, we hope you'll stay tuned and stay happy. We'll see you in the near future. Bye.